who are to your word, oh God. With all the things, oh God, that you have brought us through mm-hmm. and all the things that you have accomplished through us, Lord God. Mm-hmm. So, Lord, we just bless your name, oh God. We just thank you for this time. I pray, mm-hmm. oh God, you just help us to have ears to hear, oh God, the things that are being brought forth tonight, Father. We keep them in our heart, Lord God. Lord, to be a, to be a glory to you, Father, in this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, grace and peace unto all of you. We're going to get started tonight and uh, coming to share with us tonight is our own Pastor Terry. So it is yours, brother. Okay. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, um, Deacon John, for the prayer. <clears throat> um, wanna, I won't be before you long, but I want to talk about a good subject we'll call um, a guiding light. Okay. So I was talking with my daughter recently and she was telling me about something called a uh, green book. She does a lot of art history and a lot of research. And what the green book was essentially was a book for people who were taking road trips, uh, specifically African-American folks. Um, and it gave them resources so that when they went certain places, they had like places they could stop, places they could eat, because obviously if they were going in the South or certain segregated places, um, you know, it was hard to find black businesses and things like that. Uh, or, you know, or if you went to a restaurant and couldn't use the bathroom, you know, they, they use this as a guidepost. And I think it was started by a gentleman, I think, um, and his, his name was Green, I believe, uh, Victor Hugo Green. Uh, I think it was like 1936. And I think he was in Harlem and he was uh, like a, uh, either a postman or a postmaster. It was just kind of a way to fight um, discrimination. So we're going to remix that a little bit um, because before there was the green book, there was something for us, which is a guiding light, um, and we'll call it our guidebook, okay? Or it could, we could also call it a gift book. We could call it a book of good news. Um, we could call it a grace book, uh, known as our Bible, okay? That's our guidebook as, as we're going to go forward. That's all I'll refer to it as is a guidebook. So if we could um, turn to the book of John 17, <laughs> if I have it so I can read it. As with the green book, essentially, these folks, um, some of our, our folks kind of, um, folks who are a little maybe older than us, were kind of outsiders going into a place. Um, so they were kind of, um, you know, in society, but sort of not able to fully participate. So what the book of John says in 17, and it says, let me look a little closer, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but you, that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them in. So essentially, it's a way, or was a way for them, um, the Green Book was, uh, a, a way for them to travel, kind of something they could lean on. Uh, and for yeah. us, the Bible is something we can lean on. Um, and it's still a guidebook that we can use. Uh, and it's obviously been used for, you know, thousands of years. So uh, uh, some ways that we can be in the world, but not of the world. So I found a little list here. In one moment, find it. And these are, I believe, five practical ways we can be in the world but not of the world. Now we're not talking about folks in the 1930s and 40s. We're talking about us, the faith. We're talking about believers everywhere. Okay. So one of the ways we can be in the world but not of the world is we can be, or we have to be present in the world. So Christians should be present in the world. We should not withdraw in anywhere. Our God-given mission requires us to be present. Okay, so being present is one. The second is don't compromise. While we can't withdraw from culture, we also can't compromise what's most important. We need to listen to what God says is best, not what the world says. So once again, that comes from our our guidebook. Third is we need to use a filter, and that filter being the word of God. Every minute of every day, we are bombarded with messages from social media to billboards to news reports, political leaders and TV shows to influencers. 
we are constantly being told we need something new or what to believe. Christians, us, household of faith, believers everywhere, we need to take all that, all these messages and filter them through what is true, and what God says is best. Number four would be this, stay on mission. So as a household of faith, as believers, we need to stay on mission. And that says, we will run into resistance if we choose to follow Jesus. We should expect that and prepare for it. That way we can stay on our mission. The best way to do this, surround yourself with other followers of Jesus who can encourage and help you. So that's sort of what we're doing now, encouraging one another as we're on Bible study, okay? So those five ways, if you need me to repeat them, I'll repeat them. My wife said I was going a little fast, so I'll repeat. Five practical ways to be in the world, but not of the world today. Be present in the world is one. Don't compromise is two. The filter is our word of God is number three. Stay on mission is number four. And I'm sorry, number five, if I didn't read this, is hold on to hope. So number five, hold on to hope. While Jesus promised us that we would have trials and troubles in this life, he also promised that he would be with us, okay? So we, we call ourselves people of the book. We know now that we have this instruction manual that is also a history text, which also Deacon John is really a pathway to the future. So like we know how the story ends, right? So when we read the Bible, we know it's, you know, events that have happened, but also kind of where we're going. So it's always good when we're going somewhere to have a guidebook, right? To have a map. And some of the ways, or, or, or let's say this, we'll, we'll say it's, it's kind of good news that's been translated for us. And I think it was Bishop Way who said uh, at our retreat that leaders, uh, stewards, ambassadors, us, believers in Christ, um, will be ineffective if we can't speak the king's language, right? We represent the king. We're ambassadors, right? And we were given a translation book. Right? So this is the language we have to speak. Now, it's obviously in different versions of the Bible. It can be in different languages. We can speak in a different tongue. But this is the king's language that, that we have to point forward. And it's been translated for us. But we know also that kind of this is the word of God. But we know God obviously can't be just contained in a book. Right? Um, God is larger than, I don't want to say the Bible necessarily, but he's larger than, you know, in a book, obviously, everything that happened in the Bible can't even be contained in this book, right? So we know that. Uh, but our job is to follow it diligently. Our job is to remember that the Word of God is wiser than we are. Right? Deacon Carolyn, a lot of times we think we know what we're doing, right? But, right, our guidebook should be telling us what to do, where to go. And it also describes how the world works. We don't think about that, but it has all the, all the natural laws, Right, gravity, all those things, nature, all that constellations, it's all in the word. We, you know, we, we forget that sometimes that it encompasses really all those things. And it definitely has answers to the choices we're confronted with daily. And we say, well, yeah, but Pastor Charles, you know, there's sometimes we go to uh, the, the golden bowl. You know, what's that? You know, when we sit down and we say, hey, what are we going to eat? Right. And we said, you know, you know, God's not concerned about that. Like we, you know, right? All, all those kind of minutiae. If we go to McDonald's, right? We look at the menu. What are you going to order, right? But but the, the books give us instructions. Let's go to Matthew six. I'll look it up for you, and I can read it. And I believe it's Matthew six and twenty five, and it says this. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Right, what you would eat or what you would drink. So God is taking care of all of it. Now He's given us free will to do it, but it's all contained here. Right? We we think God is not concerned with those kind of small things, right? But He's concerned about everything, even if we're a golden bull. And we also can't think because we we have this guidebook, but we can't think that we know better. I think we were saying this earlier. Um, and a lot of us want to make our own decisions, right? We want to call our own shots, system of lore. Um, you know, we want to be Kareem. We, everybody wants to be self-made, right? Everybody wants to say, hey, I did this, right? It's, it's all me. But imagine if we went into a, to a doctor. Imagine if we had to go to the Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, 
Um, Deacon Conrad, if we had to go to Will's Eye Hospital, right, and we went in and we were sitting with the, the best specialists on earth who, who dealt with eyes, glaucoma, whatever, and he says, hey, you know, what do you want to do? We like, hey, you know, we came to you because you're the expert, right? So a lot of us want to, hey, we, I have all the answers, but like when we, we're, we're actually looking for answers, and that's why we can use the, uh, the book. That's why we can look to the Lord for all those things we go through, all those things, you know, in our, our daily life kind of, and, and letting us know that we're kind of dependent on him. So that's the kind of proof that the word was made for us, made for people like us, I should say. I think it was um, Pastor Cliff who talked about the Declaration of Independence, talked about that kind of um, cataclysmic event that happened in Genesis 3, right? So creation was going one way, and like after Genesis 3, things were totally different. We called it, you know, the, the Declaration of Independence, and, and you know, kind of how absurd, absurd it was to think that we could do whatever we wanted to do, right? That God wasn't in control, and, and we kind of abuse free will and that's kind of a warning for us so so we'll say no more declaration of independence we'll say like we'll, we'll make it because of the word we'll make it 180 degrees and we'll say we'll make a pledge of allegiance to god so not a declaration of independence not a separation but a joining in so we want to join in with the lord and what he's doing so this guidebook the word is leading us to a good and fulfilling life some say it doesn't speak to the modern things of life, you know, like, hey, what, you know, what's, what's the Bible have to say about this or that? What's it have to say about my job? But if we go to Ecclesiastes, and I'll go there, and we're going to go to Ecclesiastes, I believe it's one. And it says this, starting with the ninth verse. And remember, what, you know, we're talking about you know, what does the word have to say about modern life? What does our guidebook have to say about modern life? And it says this, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. There are anything of which one can say, look, there is something new. It was already here long ago. It was here before our time. Right? So even those small things we're thinking about, nothing really in the human condition has changed since the beginning of time, despite technology, despite uh, the fact now we live all over the globe, we're connected kind of through um, uh, things like Zoom, email, and those kind of things. Really, nothing has changed. Nothing is really new in some ways. Also, our guidebook, uh, the word is kind of practical for us. So, but, but at the same time, we have to read it and apply it to our life. I think it was um, Pastor Crystal or Minister Crystal who was saying that we not only have, have ears to hear, but kind of we also have to carry out what the word is saying to us, right? Because if we're not doers of the word and, and just hearers only, we're kind of missing out. So the word, our guidebook tells us to be born again, right? Translated. It tells us to let go of our old identity, right? Right. And Mount Phyllis, it also tells us our word, our guidebook, right, tells us to let our friends and family know that we've changed. Right. That's where the, our witness really begins. We think of our witness going to out in the street and meeting strangers, which is OK, too. But if, even our family first should know that we've changed, like there's something different about us once we've accepted Christ. That's all, all that is contained in our guidebook. So our job is to bring the book with us everywhere. Right. So I used, to, I used to go to hotels a lot with work, and there would be a Bible in every room, right? Or, or in every dresser, in, in every room you checked into, whether it's from the Gideons or someone else. But also we can hide the word in our heart, right? And of course, we can always, these days, right? The word can always be with us because we have our phone, right? So there's really no excuse. If someone says, hey, you know, get, pick, pick up your Bible, or, or let's read the Bible or, or when we're in service and we're going to do that. Everyone has access, right? It doesn't have to be a hard copy. So let this word, let this guidebook be a constant reminder and a reference in all situations where we go. Also, Bishop Wade, who said this, and I pulled out this quote from my notes. Uh, he said that God is quite talkative, but if you won't take the time to listen, he'll be an introvert, right? So God will be with us, but he won't say much, right? 
because maybe we're not paying attention or maybe we're, we're too busy talking, right? There, there has to be a time when we listen and, and absorb, right? And part of that listening is reading the word, right? Not just reading for a message, but, you know, perusing the word, spending time uh, with the word. Our job is also to memorize the parts of the, the word, our guidebook, the Bible, um, you know, to memorize scriptures and stuff like that. You know, in the same way we can memorize songs, right? Yeah. Um, you know, if, if I said some of these words, you, you guys remember because we, uh, you probably memorize it. So if I said something like this, Bishop might know this, uh, maybe even Deacon John, definitely Elder Wesley. So if I said, all you beginners know that you've got to start somewhere, right? Whether you're saints or sinners, right? Smile and share, sunlight as well as shadows, while you learn that everyone cares, everyone out there has a cross to bear, right? And we'll never dare live alone because we're not stones, right? Rolling down the mountainside, right? We all count. We've got strength, we've got pride, right? Because God is on our side. That's from the main ingredient. There's no just song lyrics. But things we, right, things we memorize, right? So in the same way we can memorize that, we should be able to memorize the things here, right? So we don't always, um, or, or I should say the guidebook reminds us to not always just follow our passions blindly or our desires. So remember, we can go back to Genesis 3 and, and Adam and Eve in that um, tree. Um, last time I spoke, we went to Second Samuel, I think it was 11, uh, where David saw something that, um, you know, piqued his desire, right? So the book has rules. And some of those rules or, or, or I shouldn't say some, but the rules are unbreakable, right? We can't just blindly follow what we want to do, kind of how we feel, right? And that's the irony is that rules give you freedom, you know? It gives us kind of a, a structure. And we need to rise above, or, or it tells us to rise above our instincts and desires. As we rise above those, we, we still might have those desires, but we don't do what they say. Right? So remember Esau, who kind of sold his birthright, right? For some curry chicken or whatever the meal was that he ate. Um, you know, in that same way, we have to change how we think, right? So although he wanted that thing, um, you know, and, and was hungry, kind of, um, you know, we have to keep, or the, the guidebook reminds us to keep those kind of things in check. And, and like I said, it's about changing. It teaches us to change how we think. So, you know, we would maybe back in the day, we would get a, a big check, um, Minister Crystal, and we would think about going to Atlantic City, right? Or we would think about going to Las Vegas, or we would think about going to the outlets, uh, Sister Harriet, right? You know, you got a big windfall or something like that. And we want to go out and spend the money. Like, but when we get in the word, we start thinking like, well, hey, okay, well, I got this. I know God gets this much, right, for my time. Or like, who, who can I bless with? You know, so it's about kind of this guidebook is having us change kind of how we think, um, changing our, our MO, as we would say. So, so we know that the discipline that comes from our guidebook turns into... Um, turns intentions into action, right? So I learned that with, um, you know, the kind of uh, undisciplined moments kind of at the time seem harmless, right? But if, you know, one extra French fry, maybe one extra puff of cigar, right? Over time, right, is not good for us, right? I learned um, discipline riding with a, a few of the um, seasoned saints, uh, the summer riding bikes and stuff like that, right? So it was like, hey, I was like, man, it's like 90 degrees. And they're like, hey, yeah, but we still ride, right? We said we were going to ride and, you know, it's going to be a good sweat, right? So that kind of discipline is good for us, believe it or not, right? So without discipline, tiny things can lead to our downfall, right? And let's go to Song of Songs. I believe it is chapter two, and I'll read. And it says in chapter two, I think it's verse 15, and it says, catch for us the fox that ruin our ministries, that ruin our momentum, that ruin all those good things that we're doing, right? That ruin our harvest. So it's those little things that can kind of get out of control. Um, and like I said, also self-control is rewarded, 
right? So think about when we went on the last fast. It's been a while since we've been on the fast, but um, corporately, but you might have been on your own. But think about how good you feel when you're at the end of the fast, knowing, like, hey, okay, I'm going back to whatever, eating Cheetos or um, drinking soda, whatever you might do. Uh, but but at the time, you, you know, that kind of physical discipline is kind of a reward. Right. Because physical discipline, mental discipline, all is tied in with spiritual discipline. Right. So we're getting once again all that from our guidebook. Right. And if we don't obey the guidebook, what can happen to us is we can find persuasive people or we can get have technology kind of distract us. Right. And, and take us off of our destination. Right. So that that kind of being undisciplined gets in the way uh, of our, our destination or set astray. So let's read from the book of Nehemiah. And I believe it is chapter two again, and I'll read. I believe this is either NIV or NLT, NIV. And it says, and once again, we're talking about um, kind of distractions and, and um, being disciplined. And it says, Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gate ha gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. We will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of God upon me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding, right? I think talking now about the, the people of Israel. So they began this good work. But then all of a sudden, the, this gentleman comes up, right? And then Sambalat, the Hanarite, Tobiah, the Ammonite, officials, and uh, a, another gentleman, uh, the Arab heard about it, and they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they said? Are you rebelling against the king? Right? So that's the distraction. So they were doing a good work, and they were saying to them, like, well, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Right? Why are you guys, why are you following this? Right? Th th this is an ancient book. Why are you doing that? That's what someone might say. But we what we would say is what they said in verse 20. The God of heaven will give us success. Servants will be... We'll start rebuilding, but as for you, you will not you will have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Also, let, let's talk about some people who think they can maybe bypass the rules, right? Or some people we see breaking the rules. Right? What, what do we think about them? I call it the um the FOMOs versus the YOLOs, right? People who, you know, some people think they're missing out. Right. Some people say, hey, you only live once, let's do you know, let's do something that's outside of this. Right. Or, or I always do all the right things and I'm not getting ahead. What about me? Well, the book, the guide book actually addresses that too. So let's go to Book of Psalms. And it is thir number 37. And I'll read once again. This is the NIV. And it says, once again, we're talking about people who maybe break rules anything outside the guidebook. And this is what the guidebook says about that. Do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. For like grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Do all in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. And we skip down a little. It says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. So once again, it's not, you're not missing out on anything, right? Or it's not a, you only live once kind of thing. And then it says this in verse nine, for evil men will be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. For a little while, the wicked, or in a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you will look for them, they will not be found, right? So it's not about thinking we're missing out on anything. It's not about, um, you know, like being, I should say jealous of these other people, right? Because we have a guidebook, and if the guidebook tells us what do we do that? So so to summarize, our guidebook, right? We'll call it our guiding light, right? The word for us, the people of God, uh, saints of Household of Faith, Deliverance Worship Center, folks on this Bible study, right? This good, good book, for us, um, prescribes that we're always making a contribution, right? That we're resisting temptation, right? That we're being our best, right? We're running a race, not just to run, but to win, 
right? And we're following it because it is indeed our instruction manual. Okay, that's all I have. So thank you all. All right, thank you, Pastor Terry. Amen. Anyone uh, have any questions or anything that you need uh, to be clarified? All right. Pastor Terry, that was a good lesson. Excellent. Thank you, sir. All right. All right, thank you uh, again, Pastor Terry. Uh, don't forget uh, this weekend, um, got God's Treasure House on Saturday. Uh, if you want to go, we're leaving the church at 5, 5.15, amen. And uh, pray for um, Deaconess Tracy, her Father's uh, service is this Saturday. Um, I will uh, will send out um, uh, an email. It's in McConnellsburg, uh, Pennsylvania. It's about two hours from here. So pray uh, for the family. And uh, I don't think uh, I have any other announcements. Anybody? Have anything I'm missing? Bishop, I just have a quick question. Is um, you, you said the treasure house is this weekend, Saturday? Yes. Now, does that um, kind of supersede um, our practice? Okay, okay. So we're not going to practice. We're yeah. going to just meet on Sunday. Okay, I just want to know that. Okay, I'll yeah. let you know that. Yeah. All right. Or we can practice at God's treasure house. <laughs> That's an alternative. Yes. <laughs> we'll have the outing on Sunday. How's that? <laughs>